Hey guys, welcome back to the Psalms to Guide YouTube channel. Today I am going back to an old format that I used to do on the channel, um, hopefully with better quality this time, but I used to show you guys my podcast episodes, or I used to record the podcast episodes for the YouTube channel as well as for regular Spotify, Spotify, Spotify podcast types of channels. Um, and now that I'm back to regularly journaling for my episodes, I thought I would go back to trying to film it for the YouTube channel. So if you guys like this content, like, comment, all of those things, um, and I'll keep doing that for this season. If not, then, you know, no love lost. I will just journal on my own for it. Um, nonetheless, let's jump straight into this episode. I will be showing my journaling on the screen I'll make myself little in the corner, um, but these are the notes that I was taking as I was studying for the episode, so what you'll see may not match exactly what I'm saying. There are some things I had to go back and re-research, um, <clears throat> but it's just kind of a works in progress, a show of how I study as I am coming together with information and content and just the process of studying in general, so here we go. We've been talking about prophecy this season, and my first couple of episodes are about kind of general topics of, you know, the things that annoy me about how most churches teach uh, prophecy and about fear mongering and things like that. Um, I've also done an episode on different frameworks that people use to interpret prophecy, things like futurism, preterism, historicism, and idealism. And if you haven't checked out those episodes yet, I think they will be helpful in understanding what framework or what point of view I'm trying to approach this from, and also for just the sake of studying Revelation or Daniel or anything like that for your own self. Um, but I'm going to try to make this episode as standalone as possible because I know people have trouble with series and sometimes you don't watch things in order. It's okay. I understand. I do that too. So this episode is on Revelation chapter 1. And guys, I have read this chapter so many times. I started reading the book of Revelation uh, back when I was probably like 13 or so. And I've read this I've probably read this book like once a year since then. Um, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And no matter how many times I read it, I still learn new things. I still come away with new questions every time I read it. So preparing for this episode was really challenging because I feel like there was so much information. Um, I was almost tempted to split it into like two different episodes. There's just so much to talk about. So I have a much lengthier post on my blog. Um, I'm going to try to condense things for the sake of the episode. But if you're really interested and you really want more content or more information, um, I highly suggest going to the blog. That being said, uh, the first thing that I noticed was actually verse three. We're going to go back to verse one um, because there's a lot of importance throughout every verse in the chapter. But verse three really stood out to me. And I'm going to read you the New King James Version because that is the one that I copied down. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The reason this verse stood out to me is because a lot of people don't want to study prophecy. And a lot of this comes from the futurist belief in a pre-tribulation rapture. So a lot of people feel like they don't need to know what's going to happen because as long as they're saved, they won't have to see any of this and it doesn't matter. Um, but as we go through these verses, you're going to see that it, it does matter. And this verse right here tells you flat out that you are blessed by reading and understanding and keeping these prophecies in your heart and and under you know and, and studying this. So I think it's interesting because like I said, I most churches that I've been to stray away from this. They don't want to talk about it. It's scary. It's the big bad. Um, and I get it because until I understood that this was about the final victory and that the whole goal is for us to be on the winning side, which means that it's not really bad for us. Um I was also scared. 
I used to have nightmares about the end of the world when I was a kid, which is actually what prompted me to actually read Revelation for myself. And so I think this that I think that a lot of that is what stood out to me in this verse. And like I said, I've talked to my other friends who are believers, and a lot of them will say things like, Yeah, I don't I don't want to read that. I don't want to know. Um, but that's not really what we're called to do. Now, if you go back to the first verse, we're told flat out that we are supposed to be reading it. So the first verse is basically establishing what the whole book is about. And I think it's interesting because it reminded me of like English class where they tell you to write like um, like a topic sentence and you're supposed to basically like summarize the paragraph in your topic sentence. It just seems so formal and well put together. In this verse, they establish that this is the book of Revelation of the Messiah, that it is given by the Most High, that it's meant to be shown to the servants, the believers, us, right? It's meant for the people. Um, if it wasn't, if it didn't affect us, then why would it be sent to us? Why wouldn't this be something that you're preaching on the corner to the sinners, right? This, if we, if it wasn't meant for us to know, then, and, it, and if it had no importance or value for us to be reading, then it would be like, you know, the street preachers running around being like, you, you know, you're, you're in danger of the hellfire, but that's not how this was written. And, you know, the street preachers, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother shebang right there. We'll, we'll get to that in a whole nother episode. Um, but also in this first uh, verse, it says that the events are meant to take place shortly. Now, we're going to get into shortly in a minute because I think that's a really interesting. Um, and depending on, like I said, your framework that you use to evaluate Revelation, you're going to see that word differently. But we're going to get into that. And um, that first verse also tells us that it was established by an angel and sent to John, who is the author of Revelation. So that's a lot of information wrapped up in one. And to be honest, I spent a lot of time just in that verse, um, researching particularly on the word shortly and like who the, the believers are, the servants. We're going to get a lot more into that as the episodes go on, because a few verses later, you'll see that uh, John is told to take this message to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And in Revelation 2 and 3, we're going to go get way more leveled down into those churches of Asia Minor. And, you know, in some ways you're like, oh, was this only for the churches of Asia Minor? And there's there's like a lot of questions I had reading it about like why specifically these churches. So for instance, if you go into the New Testament and you read the letters of Paul or any of the, the letters of the New Testament, they're not written, there is no, there, there really aren't letters to like Smyrna or Philadelphia or Laodicea. And so there's, you know, the question of like, one, are those like missing books? Like were there letters written to them that just didn't make it into the canon? Because they seem to be very important here at the end and we don't really get a, a, a really good picture of them leading up to that. Then there is the question of like, for instance, there were churches in Africa. There was a church in Alexandria. There was a church in Ethiopia. In fact, the Ethiopian church is one of the oldest Christian churches in Christian history. And they're not mentioned. And of course, for those who are preterists and believe that all of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD, there's the question of like, why not the church in Jerusalem? Like there were, of course, the initial disciples and the body that was like located in Jerusalem, in Judea. Why wasn't a letter written to that church? Like what made these churches in Asia Minor so special? And on top of that, if this is about the fall of Ju of, of, of the temple and of uh, Jerusalem, why do the churches in Asia Minor need to know? Why did the Gentiles care? Like, I'm not saying that it's not important for the rest of the body, what's happening to others. I mean, like right now, there are countless wars going on across the world. 
And, you know, I have friends who have family in different locations where there is war and I worry about my friend's family, not nearly as much as my friends worry about their families. Um, but, you know, like it like you hear about it and it is it it breaks your heart and you're sad and you're like, what can I do? I wish I could do something to help these people. But it doesn't affect my day to day life. Like I still get up and go to work and go to the grocery store and come home and clean my house and watch movies or listen to music or journal or create podcast episodes. And it's not like I had to stop living or something like, it's not like I had to pack up all of my life and flee and, and go to a refugee camp or, um, you know, try to find health items or feminine products or whatever, the way people who are torn apart by these types of events are. So if if you are a Gentile living in Asia Minor and the Romans sack the temple, aside from being hospitable to take in the people who have been displaced, why do you need such a heavy warning about that? That's a question that I think preterists have to grapple with. Um, And I think that's also still a question for us as believers in the future to think about like, why are these seven churches so important? And what is it that they, why were they singled out? And so like when it's, because it starts out saying, you know, that this message is for the servants, the believers, Then it goes into specifically giving these messages to the seven churches. So, you know, you have to wonder, are they, are we all supposed to know about the seven churches? You know, we put, we put them on blast. There's a symbology here, or is it really just specifically for those churches and it has nothing to do with us? That is a question for each person to ask themselves as they study. So that's one big thing that came up both in that first verse and as I kept drilling down into the verses. The second thing that kept me in that first verse is the phrase shortly. Now I looked up this word and if you are watching me doodle, you'll see me write down that shortly doesn't mean shortly, but it does. I looked up in an interliterary concordance the word and the first time I looked at it, the word that seemed to line up with shortly was something that didn't mean shortly at all. And I was really confused. And I went through and I was looking at all the different translations and all of them were saying shortly, soon, quickly. And I was like, how are they getting this from this definition? And so eventually I went back to redo the word study because I was like, I, they can't have all just gotten this wrong. Um, and when I went back, I realized that the way I was looking at it was not right. (laughs) And so I had picked the wrong word to match up to the word shortly. And the word that's there in Greek really does mean shortly or with a quickness or, you know, something like that. And I think it's interesting because I guess this is one of the things that really has this touch and go with believers because it's like he, he kept saying he was coming back shortly and of course, Preterists would use this to also say that, you know, he was talking about 70 AD. But for those of us who are either historicists or futurists, then you have to explain like 2,000 years. He'd been gone 2,000 years. That doesn't seem like shortly to us as human beings. But one thing that I thought was interesting is number one, We're told that this message is supposed to go to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which means that shortly cannot be before the message could even get to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, back then there were no planes that we know of, so they could not just hop aboard a plane and pop over overnight to each location and you say it takes, you know, maybe a day, two days, three days at the most to get all of these messages delivered. A week tops, you know, that's not how it went. I ended up Googling how long it would take to walk from Patmos, which is where John would have received the vision, to Ephesus, which is the first church that he was supposed to deliver the message to. 
And it said roughly, I think, 20 hours, something like 20 hours to walk and boat. Because obviously, Potmos is an island. You got to boat part of the way. But you wouldn't do that straight. Like, there's no way you would just boat and walk straight for 20 hours or whatever. So this probably would have taken like two or three days to get just from Patmos to Ephesus. And then they would have to go from Ephesus to Smyrna, from Smyrna to Thyatira and and all of this stuff. Um, And we don't really know, like, assumably it wasn't John that was going because John was in exile. Um, I don't know that he could leave Patmos. So he probably had to write all of this down and then give it to a messenger. And then the messenger would have had to take it. Um, But either way, we're not told if the person stays. Like, does the person just go drop off the letter and keep moving? Like our postal people today, they just hand you your, they just put the mail in the box and keep on going. Or is this like, for instance, I go to deliver a package to like a relative. I'm going to stop and chat. How are you? How have you been? What's been up? I'm going to fellowship with you for a while. You're going to give me dinner. We're going to, I'm going to spend the night. Like what kind of relay service actually happened? Because it's very possible that the messenger went and gave the message to the church in Ephesus and fellowshiped with them for a day or two and then left. So we that would add more time to how long it would take the delivery. There's also the question of how many copies were made. So, I mean, today we could just email and it would be like lightning fast. And you could just CC everybody, lickety split. But John had to write all of this by hand. Did John write seven copies out? If he wrote out seven copies that time in the front that it took him to write down each copy but also even if he wrote one copy and sent it then the church in Ephesus would have had to copy it or memorize it or something before they passed it on to the next church so there still would have been a time in which they would have had to wait in between each passing and I point this out to say that it could have taken like a month or more just for the message to get to all seven churches in Asia Minor. And that's not including the possibility that the message was not just meant for them, but it was meant to get to them and then to spread to those churches that I mentioned that were in other places, whether it be the church in, you know, Alexandria, the churches in Ethiopia, churches in other places like the church in Corinth, which is not mentioned here, Um, All of these churches may have also been meant to receive this information. So so shortly is relative to how long it would have taken for all the believers to get the information. But also short and like shortly is something that even in today's society, it, it depends on the context, right? If I'm driving down the road talking to you on the phone and I say I need to get gas, you probably assume that I'm going to stop and get gas while I'm driving um, because otherwise my car may run out of gas and I may be on the side of the road. That's that's a different type of shortly than even if I'm just sitting in my house and it occurs to me and I'm like, oh, I think I need to get gas. I may get gas in the week. Like I might not go out and get it right then or that day, but I might get it the next time I'm out, Right. Um, Other things like, um, for instance, I recently moved and I don't particularly like the lights that came with the house. Um, I would like fans. I'm a big fan person. And so I keep saying to my parents, I'm going to replace the overhead lights with fans soon. I've been in the house for like three months. I have not replaced that. Soon is dependent upon whether or not I get a bonus or not and what that bonus looks like. Um, soon is, 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 is relative. It's like, oh, it's on my to-do list. It's something that's going to happen probably within like a year, maybe two years, depending on the finances. Like, But it's not like I'm going to run out to Lowe's and buy a new fan tomorrow and have somebody install it. It's not urgent. 
right? So shortly it has different connotations based on what is taking place. And I think given the scope of Revelation as a whole, we haven't really gotten into everything that's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure, you know, even if you're not a believer, even if you weren't raised in the church, you've heard about the wars and the famines and all of these things that culminate in, you know, him actually coming back and, um, you know, it's a, it's a large scale thing. So soon relative to such a large event seems like it may be a, a lot more than, you know, two days or three days or whatever. Um, so there's that. But then there's also the fact that we are talking about spiritual and divine versus human and mortal. There is a verse in the Bible that says that a thousand years with the Lord is like a day and a day like a thousand years. And there's a lot of things in the Bible when you start getting into prophecy. They have this day for a year principle. We'll get into that when we start talking about Daniel um, in particular, where there are these visions and in the vision, they talk days, but then if you convert the days to year to a year, and this principle is given in the Bible too, don't worry. We'll get more into that at that point. But um, for conciseness sake, um, you'll see that the prophecies play out with each day representing a year, not a day. And so then when you go back and you look at this other verse that talks about how, you know, a day is like a thousand years to to God and you know and a thousand years like a day you start to see a difference in how time is processed by the most high or by a heavenly being and it makes sense when i think back to my childhood i felt like time moved really slow i i was always waiting for the next holiday the school dance the you know, the summer, spring break, whatever. And it never got there close enough, like soon enough. Um, I remember feeling I was like I was in elementary school forever. Like I could not get out of elementary school and move into middle school. But college went by super fast. Like I feel like I was a freshman and then I was walking across the stage and I was like, wait, no, no, I'm not ready. Can I stay for another year? I don't want to pay for another year, but I want to stay for another year. <laughs> and um, I feel like that's how adulthood has been too. Like time just flies all of a sudden. And, you know, one day, I mean, even like today, it's my day off and I wake up and I start doing things. And the next thing you know, it's like five o'clock and I'm like, wait, how did that happen? The day's already gone. And so as I get older, I feel like time moves faster. Part of that is because I have more responsibilities, I have more things to do, um, but also it's because your your experience is different. When you are two years old, a year is half of your life, right? When you're 10, five years is half of your life, but now at 35, five years is not that, it, that's such a small time. It's such a small scale in the grand scheme of things. And I imagine when I'm 90, you know, I pray I make it to 90, but I imagine being 90, then those times seem even smaller. Like 30 years is only a third of your life. My lifetime is only a third of certain people's lives. Like I have, a, I have an aunt who just turned 90 and like, what's 30 years to her? That's not even half of her life, right? And so the way you process time changes as you get older. Now, for us, our life expectancy is only, you know, 70-something, 80-something. Some people are fortunate enough to get into their 90s, to their hundreds. But for the Most High, who is eternal, who is forever, can you imagine, like, Time is almost irrelevant. I mean, it's basically irrelevant. Time is only something that matters to us. And so I can see how, you know, a day, a thousand years, it's all kind of the same. And so if, in fact, this shortly is on his watch, then 
he's only been gone for like two days in his in his mind or in his realm of of timekeeping. And so that's where I think we see the word shortly, but we don't really have a concrete understanding of whether it's shortly for us or shortly for him. And that's something, again, like I said, I try to, I try not to push my opinions on people or what I personally am convicted of, but to help people to read and understand for themselves. Because anybody can come on the internet and tell you anything, but it's important to just open your mind to thinking. Come let us reason. Read the word, talk to God, ask the questions, and let the Holy Spirit answer what is supposed to be filled in because a lot of our modern teachers put their own interpretations in and start telling you what these things mean and skip the questions and how they got there and that is why there's a lot of misunderstanding with the word so I wanted to point those things out now we're already like way into this podcast like I should be wrapping up and I haven't even talked about the description of Christ, which is even more detailed. So seven is a number that comes up quite frequently in the Bible. You know, the, we were, you know, the creation week is seven days, the seventh day Sabbath. There were all these sevens. There were seven feast days. Um, there was the, the Jubilee, so the sevens of sevens and things like that. There's the 70 week prophecy in Daniel. We see seven appear a lot. And Revelation is no exception to that. The number seven appears 12 times in Revelation 1. Just Revelation 1. We haven't even gotten into these seven trumpets and seven vials and, you know, seven seals. Um, Just in this chapter. We get seven churches, seven spirits, seven candlesticks, seven stars, and seven angels. These are the five sevens, but they're mentioned so many times, like it's it's repeated, which is meant to call your attention to it and to the number seven. And of course, 12 is also a number that comes up. It represents like a completion, a, a government, like the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, so I think it's interesting that seven is mentioned 12 times in Revelation 1. And so that's one thing that I wanted to point out as an interesting, just an interesting tidbit. Um, Now, before we jump into this description, I do want to caveat something. And it's, it's a little touchy, and it's a little difficult to articulate. So bear with me. But for those of us who are not white, I think There are certain verses in the Bible that we really feel like should be emphasized in a particular way because they point out the not whiteness of people in the Bible. And the reason we feel that that it's important is because the Bible has been whitewashed and people of color have been erased from it as though it's not really about us. And there, if you listen to people, people will be going around and they're like, you know, it's the white man's religion. And it's not. It's a religion that started in the Middle East. It's a religion that one of the first converts was an Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian church is one of the oldest churches in the history of Christianity. It's not a white religion. And a lot of that has been obscured by people putting up images, which is forbidden by the second commandment, but putting up images of people they claim represent the disciples, represent the Messiah, and then making movies and casting white actors to play people who are supposed to represent these people. When, and in fact, even if you just went and met people who are born and raised in these regions that are discussed in the Bible, you would see that they're not white. I mean, legally speaking, they can check white on paperwork, but they're not white in the context of what we would typically define as white. And so I think in a lot of regards, some of us cling to these passages of this description 
to point out the fact that our Messiah looks a lot more like us than people let, let on because he is described as having bronze or brass feet and he's described as having, you know, hair like wool. And we know, you know what that visually says, right? Um, and so I see a lot of people that when they get to these verses, they focus in on those things. And while those things may be true of his actual human appearance, I don't think that's what the focus of these verses in particular are supposed to be on. Now, before you get upset that I just said that, I do think there are other verses in the Bible that support the fact that the Israelites had, for instance, curly and kinky hair. If you go read Song of Solomon, it talks about their hair looking like a cluster of dates. I lived in South Florida for a while. I've seen clusters of dates. And let me tell you, they don't look like straight hair. They don't look like angel hair pasta. Um, and I only bring it up because, like I said, it does affect my community personally. Um, and I do hear a lot of people go more so into that aspect of these verses. And I understand why. And I understand, you know, that desire. But that's not what we're going to talk about as we go through these verses, because I believe that these verses are put here for an entirely different reason. I don't think God was particularly concerned about the man-made concept of race. In the Bible, there are bloodlines, but there are no races, okay? We all go back to Adam and Eve. We all go back to Noah and his wife and his three sons. So, like, I don't think he's really concerned about hair texture and hair color, you know, color and stuff like that. That being said, if you go throughout the Bible, when you see people given visions and dreams, they're given symbols. So for instance, Joseph is given these dreams and for like in one of his dreams, there are stars and like the sun and the moon and like the sun and the moon are meant to represent his parents because they're authorities and the stars are meant to represent the siblings because they come underneath the the bigger the bigger lights and they're bowing down to him and it's clearly a symbolic dream saying that in the future they're all going to bow down to him or they're going to owe some sort of debt to him which is what happens the same thing happens when he interprets the pharaoh's dream when he interprets the baker's dream and the butler. I think it was a butler. Um, it's not just a straightforward dream of what happened. It's symbols that are then converted to a message. This happens in Daniel. We see this with Peter and the unclean animals that turn out to be unclean nations. So like throughout all of these visions, you see this pattern of where what you're seeing is not, it's meant to, it's meant to mean something. It's not really just like, this is what's actually there. So when we see this in Revelation, there are parts of this that are told to us right in Revelation 1. We're told flat out, this is what this means. This is what that means. But the other things I think we're meant to look into the Bible and find what it's symbolizing. This is talking about the essence of the Messiah. This is talking about his presence, what his presence is makes you feel it's it, it there's a lot more to it than just like this is what he actually looked like that's my point so there are a couple of things that are pointed out we'll knock the easy things off first so there's these seven golden lampstands that he's standing in the midst of and we're told right there in revelation that these represent the seven churches of asia minor um, and it's interesting because elsewhere we're told that we are the light of the world and things like that. And so these seven churches are the light that is lighting the world during this time. And he is standing in the midst of these seven lampstands. Then he has these seven stars in his right hand. And the seven stars are the angels of the churches. Now, a lot of people straight up assume that this means the guardian angel. Um, and it's possible. But one thing that I will say is that messen or angel means messenger. 
it doesn't necessarily mean heavenly angel. Uh, there are heavenly angels, but there can also be human angels because it just means messenger. And one thing that I find interesting is when we get into Revelation 2 and 3 in the next couple of weeks, um, you'll see that each passage starts out with saying to the angel of this church, right? Yada, yada, yada. And when they're writing to these angels, the message is being given to those churches. And I think it's interesting because in the context of that angel being like the pastor of the church, um, that makes sense. Like if I wrote a letter to the, I would write the letter to the pastor and then the pastor would deliver the message. Um, but it doesn't quite make sense that that would be a heavenly being. It seems odd that the most high would come get John and give John a vision and then tell John to tell the angels that were already there that could have just seen the vision with him. Like an angel is, comes to get John to take him up like a heavenly angel, right? It just seems odd because the most high could give a heavenly angel a message directly to give to the churches. Um, now, that doesn't mean that that's not how it happened, because maybe John was meant to get it to bring it into cohesion. Maybe John was being given um, kind of like a foresight of what was going to happen so that when it was given, it would be confirmed. I don't know. Lots of things to think about. But I just think it's interesting to point out that this word angel could mean multiple things here. So those are the ones that are given right there in Revelation 1. But the other things are things that I had to look up. So we're told that the person or the being that is in the midst of the lampstands and holding the stars is like the Son of Man. I think it's very obvious that that's the Messiah. He's described as the Son of Man elsewhere in the Bible. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but that is... There is a interpretation or an interpretive jump to go from one like the son of the man of the son of man standing here to that is the Messiah. But that is the generally accepted interpretation by all schools of thought on prophecy. So there's that. Then we're told that his hair is like wool and like snow, but we're also told that it's white. So it's white like wool white like snow. And like I said, I don't think this is just meant to tell us his hair texture, though I do think it's interesting because there could have just been his hair was white as snow without his hair being like wool. And there could have just been his hair was white like wool without the inclusion of snow. I think it's interesting that both were included. There's like a repetition here. But white usually symbolizes one of two things. Um, so white generally symbolizes purity. It's very hard to keep things white. I have this image in my background uh, for the winter of snow. Um, if you've ever actually seen snow, it's hard to keep snow actually white. It turns brown and muddy as soon as people start walking through it. And it looks pretty gross. So to keep things white is it's a sign of purity um, and it's and it's used as such throughout the Bible. So in some ways, this as ascription of white to his hair and to his head could be about purity of thought, purity of, um, you know, his headship or his leadership. But also, and I think more importantly, uh, white hair gray hair is a symbol of old age. It's a symbol of being ancient, which is also typically associated with wisdom. And so I think more or less, this is probably a callback to him being the ancient of days. Elsewhere in the same chapter and throughout Revelation, he is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so I think this is more so a call to his immortality. Um, and to go from you know, being a 30 something year old man that was crucified, which is still considered very young to like into his own back into his heavenly body where he is the ancient of days, where he is, he has been 
he was, he is, and will be. And now this this age and this wisdom is showing in having this white hair. Um, that's what I think that that symbol probably means. Um, we're then said we're then told that um, there's also the feet like bronze. I'll just get those two out of the way since we brought them up early in. So the feet like bronze or brass. Um, obviously, like I said, a lot of people focus on the color. But one thing that I think is interesting is it talks about it being like burnished bronze or brass that's been in the furnace. And this took me back to Daniel. Three. So in Daniel 3, um, Nebuchadnezzar has made this statue that is based on a dream or a vision that he had that Daniel interpreted. And he is trying to change history by making the whole thing gold so that it represents his kingdom and not multiple kingdoms. But he wants people to worship it. And you have Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego or... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they are Hebrew children there with Daniel, and they refuse to bow to the statue, so they get thrown into the fiery furnace. When they get thrown into the furnace, the people who throw them into the furnace get swallowed by the flames when they open the door and throw them in, so they die. So the people who throw the man into the furnace die, but when they look into the furnace, the three Hebrew boys are walking around in the furnace with a fourth person whom is described to be like the son of God. And this is considered to be a theophany, which is like an appearance of God um, or an, like a manifestation of God outside of like his human reincarnation Um I don't know why I said reincarnation. That's not really what I meant. I meant to say incarnation. Um, but, you know, and most people assume that this is Messiah before he came in human form. So I think it's interesting because that would be like having feet like brass that have been through a furnace because he has been through a furnace. He was there with... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back in Daniel 3. Um, but there's also kind of like a symbolic note of that in that he is with each of us in our own personal furnaces, like where the furnace is symbolic of persecution or the trenches or the hard parts of life. And he will be with his people in Revelation during the end times while they're going through persecution. So I thought that was interesting. I also think it's interesting because that same statue that's mentioned in Daniel 3 is made up of different materials and each material represents a kingdom. And there's a lot about how those materials relate to those kingdoms. We'll get into that when we talk about Daniel 3 because we can't talk about prophecy without talking about Daniel. Um, but I think it's interesting because when you get to the feet in that statue back in Daniel 2, the actual statue of the vision, it was made with um, clay and iron mixed together and they wouldn't mi mix. Like it's not gelling together, which means that the feet were unstable and it means that the foundation of the statue was unstable. However, this alloy or this bronze that is making up the feet of the Messiah is well mixed together. It is, it, it is stable. It is sturdy. And so I think in a way that could represent different types of people coming together under the banner of the Most High and under the banner of the Messiah, but they have one purpose. We have one desire. We have one leader. We're on one accord, right? So there's this also this kind of factor of like unity and stuff and the foundation being there. I think those are really interesting things to look at with the feet like brass or bronze. Now, another thing that is discussed is these eyes 
that are like fire. And I thought this was interesting because a lot of times we associate fire with hell and then with Satan. And this is again where modern society has been mixing in paganism. This started back with Catholicism, but that's again a whole nother topic. Um, that goes back to like Hades and like Greek mythology. But if you actually look at the Bible, it is God who is connected to fire a lot, like for instance, the burning bush. Um, and so here we see this discussion of fire appearing in his eyes. And I think it's interesting, it's repeated elsewhere in the Bible. Um, and I was looking to see what the Bible said about fire. Cause there are all of these things that say like, you know, his presence is like a all consuming fire and things like that. And now with the, the fire in the eyes, I was like, what, what does that represent? So I did find that in Malachi three verse two, it says that he is like a refiner's fire. And I found that to be a very interesting description because when I think of a refiner's fire, I think of something that is melting something so that it can be molded or refined into something that's typically better, which goes kind of back to like the whole like the potter and the clay. Um, but you know, I was like, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense that if, you know, you're gazing on somebody with this kind of fire that shapes them and that refines them and makes them into something new. And that kind of also goes along with Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah's lips are purified by a flaming coal. So the coal is, is basically like fire. And this is true now, even now, if, like if you take um, something really hot, like fire, it, you, and you have like a wound, that's how you cauterize it. And it, it sterilizes it, cleans it, makes sure it doesn't get infected. So it's kind of like a purification type of a thing. And I was like, oh, okay. So like he's gazing out onto the world and he's purifying things. And this is kind of like a, a, a judgment type of a thing. Um, this is where I feel like some of the discussion about fire in the revelation gets lost is that those who are in Christ, those who are under his blood and who have been saved, we will appear as pure and righteous in his eyes, the fire in the eyes, right? Um, and so we will be unharmed like the bush in the, like the burning bush was unharmed. But those who are not will be burnt away. So as we think about it, like in a refiner's fire, as we walk with him, we try to shape ourselves like him. So when he starts to refine us, there is more of us left that doesn't need to be melted away. But if you stray away from him, then after you've melted away the bad things, there's nothing left. That's how I kind of read into the eyes like fire. Another description is that his voice is of many waters. Now, normally when I think about the ver the voice of God, I think of like thunder, a trumpet, something loud and authoritative. Water is not the first thing that comes to my mind, but it is used quite frequently in the Bible. There's some things in Psalms. There are some things in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. Um, there's also some stuff in Daniel about the voice like many waters. And so, you know, I think this is a different aspect of his voice. The same way our voices change and inflect based on the context or our emotion, et cetera, et cetera. I saw two different points when I looked into this, one of which is biblical, the other of which is just personal and I'm just sharing it because it's just my own personal opinion. Um, so my own personal opinion is that water is very soothing. I personally love to go to sleep listening to rain or the sound of waves or something like that, river flowing. Um, and most people I know also agree that that sound is very soothing. And so I was, I, 
in some ways, this gives off the air of, of a soothing voice to me personally. Um, that's neither here nor there. It may not, like, verses are not for personal interpretation. But I did want to share that just because I do think it says that nature testifies to his character. So I do think that there is a reason that this description is used and we are supposed to be able to relate to it because we do hear the sounds of water in our day-to-day -day life. So I, I did want to point out that kind of personal aspect to it. But from a biblical standpoint, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15 to be specific, we are told that waters in a different context, um, but waters represent nations and peoples. And I thought that perhaps when God is speaking with a voice like many waters, it is him speaking for all people or this group of diverse believers. That could be what is meant by that. Because he's speaking as the authoritative figure for many, many nations. All nations come under his kingdom. So that's one thing that I thought of. Now, another important thing that is mentioned is the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. Um, when I first read this, I thought immediately of like fighting and conquering and, you know, battle because it's a sword, right? But um, in the Bible, the two-edged sword is mentioned three times, once in Psalms, once in Proverbs, and once in Hebrews. Now, the one in Proverbs, I think, is a bit of a red herring because it talks about an immoral woman being as sharp as a two-edged sword, and I don't think that's relevant here. Um, one thing that you'll notice if you study the word hard enough is that Satan counterfeits everything. Like, Satan wants to be the most high, and so you'll see a lot of things that describe God, and then they also describe Satan. And I think that's part of how it becomes difficult if we're not really focusing in and letting the Holy Spirit lead us. That's how it's easy to get deceived, right? It says that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And so you'll see these pepperings throughout scripture where you're like, wait, I thought that was supposed to describe God. And then you see it also kind of applies to Satan. And you're like, wait, wait, right? It Study to show thyself approved to keep these descriptions on par. But sometimes it's just about using common sense. That's clearly not what is meant here in this verse. Now, the other two examples make a whole lot more sense. In Psalms, it says that a two-edged sword was being carried in the hands of the saints. And in Hebrews, it says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So I think that... The two-edged sword that's being carried by the saints is the word of God. And I think that what's coming out of the Messiah's mouth is the word of God, right? The word of God is what is dividing. That is what is judging. That is what is coming to cleanse the world and to judge the nations. And so that makes sense. The final description that's given is that his countenance is like the sun, this goes back to him being light. He says he is the light of the world. Um, in the beginning, God created light. And th this light isn't the sun. It's some other kind of light. What light is this that he created on the first day? We see this when Moses goes up to meet God on the mountain. And he comes back shining. And his countenance is, 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 is bright. And um, people can't look at him. There's a lot of verses that explain God in this manner of being this kind of just like brilliant, shining, bright light, essentially. Um, and so that is basically the description that is given of the Son of God or the Messiah that's standing there for John to see. And like I said, there's a lot in there. All of this is on my blog. Um, but I think it's really interesting and that there's a lot of things, you know, I still have questions about some things, but I think it's important for us as believers to study and to look at these different symbols and to connect them back to the Bible. Like not just to say, oh, this is what I think it means, or this is what this person told me it means, 
but to really study and to dig and to connect it back to other parts. Um, Revelation is all about connecting the dots back to what we were told already and putting it together like a puzzle. So that is Revelation 1. Thank you for sticking around for it. Um, In the next couple of episodes, we're going to go over Revelation 2 and 3. And based on what happened with Revelation 1, uh, you can go ahead and expect that Revelation 2 and 3, we will sit in for a while because we're talking about the seven churches. And in fact, I think I'm just going to do one episode for each church. So you can go ahead and expect seven episodes to come out of Revelation 2 and 3. Um, But if you want to go ahead and start reading and thinking through it, uh, be my guest. Um, As always, I think these episodes will take a little bit more time because there's so much more information. So it may be, you know, a couple of weeks before the next episode comes out. But fear not, I will be back and I hope to see you soon. Bye.